Barker. Uh, You're a legend. No, not yet. Uh, my story is is a little different. So I have parents whose hobby was marriage. Uh, my mom was married five times. My dad was married five times. Uh, my dad calls and says, can I give you advice? I said, as long as it's financial. Uh, I broke the curse. I've been married for 17 years. But by, by having, you know, so I was born in Northern California. Mom got pregnant with me at 15 to get away from her mother. Uh, she had three kids by the time she was 18. My dad came back from Vietnam. They got divorced. She, she went to Alabama. We went later to Alabama. So. Uh, I, I got there in Alabama, and it was weird, you know? Uh, yeah, it was literally weird. Uh, I went to a bunch of different schools uh, to make my story real short, and then I want to get into some stuff that can really help you guys. So uh, I went to three different high schools. Uh, my 10th grade year, uh, the stoner, or the, uh, the jocks and the Christians took me in, so I found Jesus and played soccer. My junior year, same thing, played soccer very much involved with the Lord. And then I moved to California my senior year and the stoners took me in. Uh, and I found acid. Uh, so I'm 50, so I grew up in the 80s. So that's kind of my thing. So so what happened was is that I ended up trying out for the football team. They went and realized that a couple of my credits from Alabama weren't going to transfer to California, so they wanted me to come back a following year and take some elective courses. And I was like, screw that. So I sat down with my dad. He was a stuntman. I thought I was going to be in the movie business. And he said, write down whatever it is that you want to do or you're going to need a high school diploma. And at that point, when you're given an option to quit school, my answer was, no, I won't need a high school diploma. So on my 18th birthday, my buddies took me to a strip bar. And that's what you do when you're 18. And I was talking with one of the girls and she liked my voice. She goes, oh my gosh, you got a great voice. She said, would you announce my set? And I'm like, shit, yeah, I can do it. That knucklehead's doing. You know, so I went in, I announced her set. She dug it. She gave me 50 bucks. She was naked. She gave me a hug, and then they offered me a job. And I'm like, okay, this is 1984, and I'm being offered a job to make 20 grand cash working around naked chicks, or I could go to college and get a job to make $24,000. So I already knew what I wanted to do. So my dad said, look, get out of there. You do not want to be in a place like that. And I said, Dad, I'm 18. I got all the answers, bro. You know nothing. <laughs> So I went to the University of Titties and Beer for uh, three years. My professors were Diamond, Misty, uh, they were fantastic. But I ended up dating one of the gals, and then she broke my heart. And I was like, you know, 18 years old, your first stripper girlfriend dumps you, and there's nothing neat about it, you know what I mean? So this guy offered me cocaine, and I tried it, and it didn't work. And he said, well, we should cook it. I'll show you, there's this stuff called crack. He said, so I took a hit off that pipe, and I chased that high for the next three and a half years. I went places that I could not wish my worst enemy to go to. I did things that I'm not proud of. There were a lot of things that happened. I made a lot of money. I hurt a lot of people. I lost a lot of money. I hurt a lot of people. And on April 4th, 1989, uh, I weighed 118 pounds. I was down in Los Angeles, California, living homeless on the streets in a van. And I got on my knees and I asked God to let me die. I said, you know what, God, just take me out. I was carrying a gun at the time, so I was also dealing drugs. I've always been an entrepreneur, so for a time there, I knew that the rock bands liked the chicks and the drugs, so I provided the strippers and the drugs. So I, you know, I had a lot of different things going on, but I, I couldn't be in a location where the cops could come in and get me. So that's what I mean, is I, I put myself in places that I wouldn't wish anybody else to be put in. So I got on my knees, I prayed, and I woke up the next day, and I haven't had a craving for Coast Cane since that day. So that was awesome problem was is that God didn't remove the desire to be an asshole. He didn't remove the desire to be a liar. He didn't remove the desire to be a lot of different things. So I walked to my dad's house and I said, dad, I want to get sober. And he says, I'm not going to let you in the house. And I'm like, shit, I walked 20 miles. That was not the picture I had. I thought it'd be like this great grand homecoming. And that wasn't it at all. He says, look, he says, you have been selfish. I don't want anything around your brothers and sisters like this. I said, dad, I'm at the bottom. I said, I need your help. He said, I need you to go to AA. So I went to Alcoholics Anonymous. Now, I never thought I had a drinking problem because I used to drink just so I could drive. I was so high. So I never thought alcohol was an issue. Uh, so I immediately got sober. Six months in, I knew what I wanted to do. I had two choices. First thing I did when I got sober is I went and I got my GED. Good enough diploma. Just felt that it was something that I needed to do. Then I had a question that came up. Do I go to college? I'm like now 23. It's like, do I go to college for four years? 
I decided against that. I am not against the educational systems whatsoever. I'm against learning nothing but fucking theory. And that's what a lot of these places teach you. So what I learned really quick is that I needed to go find mentors. I needed to find somebody that could fast track my learning. So I would go find out who's the baddest guy in this field. That's who I would go talk to. So I heard an article, a little interview on the radio station that says, if your friend has ever said you have a voice for radio, come to the Columbia School of Broadcasting. So they were having some open house kind of bullshit. So I went, and all these guys, I'm like, if you guys are so good, why aren't any of you on the radio? Why haven't I heard of any of you guys? But they mentioned the thing about an internship. So I went, I got the internship, KISS FM. So it was KISS FM, Pirate Radio, K KM KMET, all these great radio stations. I started, nobody had an opening, and then in the 1989, six months later, so April is when I got, six months later, of October, they were starting to book people to work for the holidays. So I got, a, I got a call that I could be an intern answering the phones. And man, I was the badass phone operator. I, they thought they were talking to a DJ, because I was just having fun with them, just being myself. So then all of a sudden, the Gulf War started. Saddam Hussein started dropping bombs on people, and they're like, dude, Rick, go watch the news, write down everything that they're saying, come back in and deliver it on the news. So I'm like, oh, my chance. I get to be a DJ. So what I did was, is I went in, I wrote it down, I go on the air, and I start reporting, like, thinking this is how a DJ is supposed to talk. And they're like, dude, you sound like you're going to puke. You're terrible. But we love your enthusiasm. So the first lesson I learned early on, be yourself. Yes. Don't be anybody but you. Okay, so there can never be another you. Be yourself. They love my enthusiasm, so they put me in a van and let me pull people over on the 405 freeway and give away money for Rick D's in the morning. I ended up, there was a rock band by the name of Nelson, twin brothers, Matthew and Gunnar Nelson. Anybody remember? Long blonde hair, pretty fellas. So we were covering their event. Some people come up to Santa Barbara. And they said, hey, you know, they were looking to meet somebody. I was driving the Kiss van. They responded, they said, hey, we're looking for a part-time DJ. Do you have an air check? And I just went to one of the DJs and said, what the hell's an air check? Somebody's asking me if I have an air check. I said, oh, it just kind of sounds like how you sound on the radio. I said, sure, I have one of those. And then I went to the producer. I said, how the hell do I make one of these air checks? I said, these people, I've learned a long time too, is that you can agree to something. And if you've got hustle, you can go find that shit out later. You know, and I'm going to tell you a really funny story here in a second. That's going to, it's interesting. So I ended up going down. Got the air check done, went to Santa Barbara. My AA sponsor said, get to Santa Barbara. First thing you do is find AA. They got great sobriety there. I get to Santa Barbara. I'm 23. I'm single. I'm on the radio. I weigh about 160 pounds at this time, looking fine as shit. I, I mean, it was, I was good looking back then. I don't know what happened, but I was good looking back then. I don't believe it. Yeah, I know. I got pictures. And I ended up... I didn't find AA. I didn't do what somebody who I should have trusted told me to do. I went on my own and I started hanging out in bars. Now listen to this. I slung drugs. I did all kinds of crazy shit. I never got pulled over for nothing. I never got arrested. Nothing ever happened. First night drinking, get my first DUI. Right in front of the Alano Club. That's a place where they hold AA meetings. Kind of ironic. Chalk that up as bad luck. Two weeks later I get another DUI. Just had a couple beers. Chalk that up as bad luck too, and then while I was waiting to turn myself on that one, because now I gotta do 17 days, I get a third DUI in a month. And I'm like, God, you were probably trying to tell me something right now. So on uh, March 17th, 1992, uh, that is my sober birthday. So I just celebrated 25 years sobriety this March. What, what's even more important though, is that I also turned 50. So I've been sober now half my life, and probably longer, younger than a lot of you guys did. But what happened was, is I quit drinking and I quit doing drugs. But I realized, shit, that's just a symptom. I'm still a dick. I still manipulate. I still use people. So I figured, now, I'm, I'm a negotiator kind of guy, too. I said, look, if I'm not going to be driving, if I'm not going to be drinking, I'm, I'm pretty cool to drive. Even though I had a suspended license, what are the chances that I'll get pulled over if I'm not drinking? The chances are real good, by the way. Do you want to know the answer to that question? I ended up with three violations of my probations. I got ankle arrest one time. I got house arrest. And then finally, I just found a judge that didn't think quite as high of me as I did. And he's like, Rick, you're not getting it. No means no. Who do you think you are? So he sends me to 11 months in Santa Barbara County Jail. Now, it is really hard to go to your boss when you're on the radio and say, hey, could you hold my job for like 11 months? So, okay, has anybody have to use the restroom? Because if you do, I'm going to say something and you might piss yourself. So I'm just warning you about that right now. Okay, so if you wet yourself... 
I told you, it was going to happen. So, my radio name that was given to me by the folks at KISS FM was Ricky Suave. All right. So, that's what I went by on the radio. The warrant was being issued for Richard Warren Barker III. No one knew that Ricky Suave and Richard Barker were the same guy except for like two people. So I thought that this shit would just magically disappear. So I was on the radio every day for six months with a warrant out for my arrest because when the day came for me to turn myself in, I chose not to. Just thought, I, I heard something like sexual limitation, seven years. I'm like, shit, I could hide for like seven years. I was stupid. But so all of a sudden, I've, I've got this warrant out for my arrest. And then one morning, all of a sudden, I hear the scanner come, and I just kind of had this sense of relief. I think I passed out. Uh, I ended up getting arrested on the air. So three and a half, now keep in mind, I'm three and a half years sober now. I'm about to go to jail sober. I didn't get caught with nothing when I was slinging drugs or drinking. Now I'm sober and I'm going to jail. Uh, I knew I wasn't getting out for a little while. I go into jail. Uh, first couple of days, I blame everybody but me. Uh, I loved Jeremy's story earlier, but that's kind of what happens. It's like, everybody, it, it's not me. It, it can't be me. Because I do all this good for everybody in the community, and I don't drink, and I don't hurt anyone, and I'm... No, these are the rules, Rick, and you didn't play by the rules. So, most humbling experience of my life is I'm coming up. One of the first jobs you have when you get to the honor farm is you work in the kitchen. So I'm serving food down there, and I'm walking up, and we're coming back from work, and Monday Night Football's on, and this lady, Debbie Davidson, is like... Tonight at 10, we'll show you after the football game why Santa Barbara's number one DJ is no longer on the air. And that pops my face. And I was there, like, dude, that's the guy from the chow hall, man. <laughs> that guy just served us our food. And I walk in and I just kind of look and then a whole bunch of other things come with that. So I won't get a, spend a lot of time on what goes on. Uh, but you get challenged a lot. There's, there's a lot of people that don't have a give a shit in life and they really try to mess with the people who do so I just tried to stay do my thing do what I could best way that I was able to do that so I ended up after four months qualifying or after two months I ended up qualifying for work release where I could get out of jail for five hours during the day and I could work and then I had to turn myself in every night but I had to have a job so I was the number one DJ on the radio for seven years and one of the stations that I left and was kicking that morning show's ass. They offered me a job to make coffee for that morning show and answer phones for $5 an hour. It was the best $5 an hour job I ever had. I got humbled. I realized that I was no better than anyone else. I realized that I shit just the same way as any other guy does. I put on my, it's like I needed that. God has a real cool sense of humor with me. Uh, whenever I get too good, just knocks my ass right to the ground. Now, I'm not here to push religion on anybody. That just happens to be part of my story. So I ended up doing that. I qualified for work release. Found my AA sponsor when I was in there. He was awesome. First thing I do when I got out uh, is I didn't call a girl. I thought about it. I called Rodney, my sponsor, and I went and I had dinner. And uh, my self-esteem was about this little. When you first get out, uh, and I don't want anybody to have to go to experience this, but when you first get out, there's like this self-esteem issue that you're dealing with. I was scared to go back on the radio because I knew someone was going to call and go, ha, ah, motherfucker, you deserved it. You know, it's like, I, the phone rang. My first night back on the air, it rang for an hour and I didn't touch it. I didn't touch it at all. And then the next hour, it starts ringing. So I, I reach over and I push the button. And I'm like, hello? She's like, Rick? I said, yeah. She says, this is Cindy. I had no idea who she was. I said, hi, Cindy. She said, uh, you cost me money. So what do you mean I cost you money? She said, I bet a friend $100 that with your ego, there's no way that you would come back on the air in Santa Barbara that you would run. She said, I'm proud of you. Go make a difference. The phone hung up. And I never met Cindy. I never saw Cindy again, but that kind of stuck with me because it taught me, own your shit. You know what? We don't think nobody knows. People know. Own your stuff. Be honest with people. Let them know that you made a mistake. It's okay. So to keep going. So my sponsor said, hey, you need to do something productive. I said, okay, what am I supposed to do? He says, my daughter's soccer team, she's 12 years old. They've lost three coaches. You played soccer growing up. You need to coach this girl's soccer team. It's only three weeks. I said, great. He said, they're called the Miss Americas. <laughs> I said, okay. He said, that's what they think about themselves. They're 12 years old. They call themselves the Miss Americas, and they've run off three coaches. What the Miss Americas didn't know is that I needed the Miss Americas at that point in my life as much as the Miss Americas needed me. And we clicked.
I ended up taking them from last to third. We ended up spending all summer together. I got offered a job to coach girls high school soccer at a school that had never had a winning record. What that was, was God preparing me and the ability to speak teenage female. Uh, I don't know if it's a blessing or a curse, but ultimately when you end up launching the career of Taylor Swift, that ability to speak teenage female worked out really well. Uh, fast forward this story is that we were, uh, 2001, uh, I was asked to build a country radio station. I figured, shit, I grew up in Alabama, knew who Johnny Cash was. I was as qualified as anybody else in Santa Barbara to start a country radio station. It was right after 9-11, uh, the world was in a different place. What I started doing is I started asking questions. I, I was playing this music, I was asking people. I was starting, I realized early on, is no one likes to fucking know it all. But if you ask the right questions and you can solve people's problems, you will never be out of work. So I started asking certain questions. And one of the questions I asked is artists would come through and then I'd never see a play. I'm like, why don't they ever play? They're like, well, they don't really have enough material. I'm like, you sign somebody to a record deal that can't play for 30 minutes? I came from like the rock world. They're like, well, yeah, I'm like, that's wrong. I said, they said, well, and we can't get people to show up at their shows. I said, what if I could get people to show up at their shows? So I ended up creating a program called Nashville to You. It was the first radio tour that got people paid. All I did was call up some people and say, hey, if I can get artists to California, will you give us 1,500 bucks, three hotel rooms at dinner? They said, yeah. So you'd go up the 101, cut across, come back down the five, get on your plane in LA and go back to Nashville. Worked out perfect. Got flown to Nashville. Everybody loved the idea. I come back to Santa Barbara and nobody freaking calls. And I'm like, wait a minute, you just flew me out, put me up in a nice hotel, told me how great I was, loved the idea. I said, what happened? I asked another question, got the answer. I said, fine, I'll do it. So I ended up solving another problem. Lesson number two, you can solve problems. You can work anywhere you want. So I ended up doing that. Guy that runs Big Machine Records ended up calling me, offered me a job. $85,000 to be a West Coast Regional. That means I had nine states, 70 stations. I help get people on the radio. I said, why are you asking me to do this? He says, I say this as a compliment, even though it's not gonna sound like a compliment. I said, what's that? He says, you're too dumb to know any better. <laughs> like, how is that a compliment? He says, Rick, he says, I'm starting this label with a dude out of Texas named Jack Ingram, a 15 year old named Taylor Swift who no one's ever heard of, and a girl that's already had a failed single someplace else. He said, I need somebody who will walk through frickin' walls and not use that as an excuse. I said, awesome. I took the job, he sends me Taylor, says teacher radio, let 30 days change both of our lives. She wanted to learn, I wanted to teach. And she asked me, she said, Rick, how are we gonna make this work? I said, we're gonna do everything different than everyone else. If we're willing to go where other people aren't willing to go, we can get results that no one else will go. That 30 days changed both our lives. Six months later, her family calls, asked me if I'd like to be her manager. I said, no. Uh, I said, I'm not qualified. They said, yes, but you're not afraid to ask questions. You believe in her. She trusts you, and you're willing to go get answers. And I learned that that was a skill set. Being able to say, I don't know, but I will go get the answer is a skill. It is not a weakness. Being a fucking know-it-all is a weakness because nobody wants to be around you. I know. I was that guy, and it hurt. So I ended up accepting the opportunity to work with Taylor. Her parents were smart. They ended up putting me on a salary. I wish every person had the opportunity to do that. I agreed to do it for two years. Coming up on the third year, I am now weigh about 300 pounds. I'm bleeding on the inside. I'm stressed out. This rocket ship is rising, and I'm like, dear Lord, I'm about to be a millionaire. We already had 13 million on the books. I was instantly going to be a millionaire. I got back on my knees, and I talked to God again. I'm like, God, is this a test? Am I going to make more money than I've ever seen in my life, but at what expense? Is it going to go out in alimony and child support? And will I know my kids? I was driving. I was gone 187 days. I would drive from Santa Barbara to L.A., catch a plane, land in Nashville, catch a bus, come back, do it all over again. Good news about being poor is I've never made decisions about money based on money because I never had it. So that's the life lesson. If you ever say, what's the lesson of being poor? That was my lesson. Don't make decisions based on money. Not all money is the right money. A lot of money can end up changing your life for the wrong reasons, not for the right reasons. So uh, I told, I called Taylor, went out and said, listen, I'll forever be grateful. I said, I'm always gonna be a fan. I said, but my kids mean everything to me. What I didn't realize was the street cred that I was gonna get by making that decision, by walking away. Because a lot of people don't walk away from the money. They're willing to lose their families and things because of it, that wasn't me. I got called by Joe Galani at Sony Music. He said, listen, I wanna have a conversation with you. I thought I was in trouble. This was the most powerful man in Nashville. I call his secretary back and I said, can you ask your why? <laughs> she says, it's time he got to know you a little bit better. So I went, I sat down with Joe. 
And he said, look, he said, not to take anything away from Taylor or Scott, he said, but my team watched what you did with her. He said, I would love to offer you a job as a consultant to Sony Music. Uh, and I said, okay, can I excuse myself for a second? I went back to the bathroom, I got on the phone, I called my wife, I said, go to Google, type in, what does a consultant do? I said, I'm being offered this job, and I have no idea what it does. She said, well, they advise in areas of expertise, and it looks like they get paid pretty well. So I went back and obviously accepted the job as a consultant at Sony Music, and I did that for three and a half years. Then I realized that, you know what, not everybody needs a manager. Most people don't know what a manager does. So I read a book called The Millionaire Messenger by Brenna Burchard, and it said, make a difference and make a living sharing your knowledge and experience with others. I'm like, well, cool, I got 25 years experience in the music business, launched the biggest star in the frickin' world. I'll do this. So I went and I started investing a lot in myself. You guys need to look at the money that you spend on yourself as tuition. Not as, man, I just blew this money to learn this. I hear that a lot. It's a tuition. I needed to learn how to speak better on video. I sucked on video, dude. I was on the radio. I had to learn how to talk in a room where nobody's at. Think about that all day where you go in and you just start talking and nobody's there. I had to learn that. I had to learn to shoot on video. So I opened up a whole bunch of online programs, blah, 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 blah. One thing led to another. But the reason that I am here is for this. Your past does not define your freaking future, period. Only you define what your future is. I'm living proof. Everybody always comes up and goes, oh man, I go, jail? <laughs> Anybody? Now Jeremy's the only one who can truck me there. It's like, yes. <laughs> you know? It's like living homeless, the unicorn, you know, you heard that. What, what we found is these are our peoples. You know, surround yourself with the right people. That's what you want to do. Find yourself with people that aren't going to just blow smoke up your ass. Okay? That's dangerous. And that can be very costly. Younger is exciting for me is because Young people get the opportunity. Here's the one thing you do not want to do. When you get a chance to sit down with somebody who can help you, shut the fuck up. I do not care about you at that point. You're asking me for my help. If you only get 15 minutes of my time and you spend 10 minutes of it talking, tell me what your problem is. I'm going to ask you what your goal is and we're going to work backwards. That's it. You know what? I don't need to understand your exact business to tell you how to get where you need to go. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. You see what I mean? We don't need, I don't need to know the technology of your business. I need to know your work ethic. I need to know your desire. I need to know, I like to call your give a damnness. You know? Do you give a damn or do you think everybody else is going to do it for you? Is it up to them to make you successful? Hell no. It's up to no one but you. And redefine your version of success. Some of you are shooting too high too soon. And every day you don't reach it, you're like, shit, I'm failing. No, you're not. You just got to readjust your goal. Get yourself a couple winners down here. And then you go get the... I always tell people, everything you do today opens up a door. And then everything you do once you get in that door opens up another door. But if you just go shooting straight for the top door and you don't hit it, your brain's going to start messing with you. Why am I doing this? I'm failing every day. No, you're failing at the wrong goal. Have the right goals. There's a lot of other cool people that need to speak. I'm going to shut up. You guys have been awesome. Thank you so much. And... Uh, Thank you, thank you, brother.